Yeah, good. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody around the world, and, and welcome to uh, another seminar. And uh, today it gives me absolutely great pleasure to introduce to you Thibaut Astic, who will talk to us about something that <clears throat> is really the new way, the modern way, the way to do things, which is an integration, full integration. Um, but before I introduce Thibaut, perhaps just mention that you're on an, an MNR, and if you want to see previous MNRs, if some of you are here for the first time, you can go to the MTNet page and you'll see past MNRs and you can view the recordings and you can register for uh, upcoming ones. You are on an MNR, so <clears throat> yeah, webinar. So you can actually, uh, you have less functionality than you do with a, with a Zoom meeting, if you're more familiar with that. You can change your audio settings. You can uh, change your chat function. Uh, you can raise your hand. And this is something we want to do, want to promote at the end of the talk. If, we, if you want to discuss, we, you can uh, raise your hand. Uh, and then through the talk, though, you can put a question into the Q&A. And uh, Thibault will be glancing at the Q&A. And if it's a, a minor thing, he, he might have time to uh, address it. So Thibault Ostic on an integrated framework for geophysical inversion, merging geophysics, petrophysics, and geology with machine learning. And this is going to be an extremely exciting uh, seminar. Uh, Thibault received his master's from uh, France uh, and then came over to uh, Canada, went to Ecole, got a sec master's, then a PhD at UBC, uh, and is currently working as a postdoc in uh, the, the GIF at UBC. He's worked doing geological mapping at the Quebec Department of Natural Resources and uh, various data acquisition processing companies. Thibault's research focuses on joint inversion coupled with petrophysical and ge geologic information and on developing source tools for geoscience community, mostly through Python. Well, perhaps before I hand it over to Thibault, I'll just mention about next week's MNR, and this will be along the same sort of theme. Uh, Graham Begg from Australia will talk to us about the architecture and evolution of the continental uh, lithosphere, outcomes from multidisciplinary mapping. So, uh, Thibault. And thanks a lot, Alan, for the introduction, and thanks everyone for joining us today. So, let me share my screen. And so can you see the, the slide okay? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, so awesome. So thanks again, everyone, for, for joining. And so first of all, uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging that, that the land on which I'm giving this presentation from is a traditional and ancestral and unceded territory of the Muskiam people. So the UBC, uh, Vancouver campus is located on their territory and I have the privilege to work on <coughs> to, to work on that territory. And so today what I'd like to present to you uh, is less focused on electromagnetics, but more on the formulation of the inverse problem. And I want to present some of the latest development and especially here at UBC regarding obtaining relevant geological information from geophysical inversion. And I want to focus our attention on the effort that are made towards merging geophysics, uh, petrophysics, and geology together into a single joint inversion framework, and how we can leverage this tool to formulate and test geologic assumptions. And so our reflection to develop that framework started from the constatation that geophysical inversion and petrophysical characterization and geological modeling are all already part of the geoscientist toolkit. Each is very advanced in its own area. However, these are often treated as independent step, each giving its own result that is not easily merged with the others to form a unique quantitative representation of the subsurface. So if we were able to integrate all those into a single inverse problem, uh, <clears throat> this will significantly uh, increase our confidence in the recovered geologic features and even reveal structures that would have been otherwise indistinguishable. And so our ob objective 
for today is to obtain from geophysical, geological, and petrophysical information what has now been named a quasi-geology model, a categorical representation of the subsurface which can be used to interpret and answer geologic uh, and answer geologic question. And so the approach we are taking here uh, with this framework to fulfill that goal is to ensure that all the information is reproduced within the inversion itself. And that includes jointly inverting multiple data sets and multi, uh, multiple physical property at the same time. And especially, and especially uh, we want to have the ability to modify and adapt the inverse problem to the geologic question that we are asking. And so before diving into our own take of the problem of merging this tool, I want to give a few examples of different approaches that have been taken in recent years. So uh, the first example I'm, I'm showing here uh, was done at uh, UBC in uh, 2017 uh, about the DO27 and DO18 kimberlite pipes. So those pipes uh, located in the Northwest Territory of Canada have been extensively, extensively surveyed and are excellent test sites. So the approach that was taken in this study, it relied on the now widely available conventional inversion code, meaning that they use a least square or Tikhonov formulation. And so I show here the first part of that study that focused on the potential fields. And so for, for that part, they had a gravity gradiometry survey and a, magnet, and an, an airborne magnetic survey from which they obtain a, a density and a susceptibility model respectively. And then, after that inversion, once, once the result was available, they used qualitatively the petrophysical and geological knowledge of the area to define threshold and classify the result into rack units. So we can see that classification and quasi-geology model right here on the right. And so this is what I refer to as a post-inversion classification. You run the inversion first and you use the available knowledge after that to def define criteria and differentiate the various units. And this approach can get very powerful, especially if you have several surveys that, that maps many physical properties. And so in this three-part study, study about the DO27 and DO18, they used uh, up to four physical properties and succeeded to define up to six rock units in the final quasi-geology model. And a similar work was also conducted at uh, Colorado School of Mine by uh, Yago's Lee's group. So what I'm showing here is the result of a 2017 paper as well on an IOCG in Brazil. And in that example, they used a uh, magnetic susceptibility model they obtained from uh, magnetic data and a conductivity model from DC resistivity. And then they use a knowledge about the geology and the petrophysics of the area to define, again, dif uh, different region in the scatter plot to obtain uh, the quasi geology model that is on the right here. Uh, they also also explored the use of uh, clustering algorithm that to run on that scatter plot to define different type of uh, different type of unit. So the idea, this is still a post uh, inversion classification in the end the idea stays the same and what change is really how you build your classifiers. And the next example goes a step further by performing multi-physics inversion. So this is an example from uh, Jad Jason's group at the University of uh, Houston. And they used a structural coupling, a cross gradient to jointly invert the gravity and magnetic data from the Quest data set that was acquired here in British Columbia. So cross gradient uh, is a coupling term that does not require any additional information. It simply assumes that change in the density and magnetic safety model are correlated. And following that joint in inversion, they uh, used again a post inversion classification uh, and available knowledge to define different rock units and obtain the quasi geology, quasi -geology model here. What's interesting with the, with the, with the multi physics and cross gradient part here is that uh, the scatter plot of the of the jointly inverted model present a characteristic and pattern that are much more easily distinguishable from each other 
uh, and those features are not visible when you invert the data set uh, independently. So you see the scatter plot here has a lot of spikes that they can cut, that they, they can categorize into two different rock units. And so that's really what they gain by using the multi physics and, and like get, get, getting a lot more structures in the scatter plot. And the final example before diving into our work, own work is uh, the work again from Jadjasson and Yagoli at uh, uh, School of Mine on uh, fuzzy semen inversion. So this is a petrophysical, petrophysically coupled inversion. So in that approach, additional information from petrophysics is required to couple uh, to couple the gravity and magnetic data. So we, so in that example, they had a few samples uh, that they, me uh, they measured for density and magnetic susceptibility, and they saw like very clear like pattern and trend into those samples. And so the goal now is not only to reproduce the geophysical data in your inversion, but as well that the scatter plots reproduce the trend and patterns that you've seen in your rock samples. And so this is what they obtained uh, jointly inverting the magnetic and gravity data coupled by the petrophysics. And we see that the scatter plot is uh, reproduced very well the, the trend that was seen in the rock sample. So this is a very closely related framework to ours on which we built upon an approach from a different perspective. And so our ultimate goal is really to integrate the various steps of geophysical inversion, petrophysical characterization, and geological modeling into a single uh, joint invers inversion framework. So I show here the high level representation of our framework of physically and geologically guided inversion or PGI. So this is, and so that's designed towards that goal. So this is a general formal and flexible mathematical framework, which uh, I, will uh, I will show you how it's designed in the, in the background and how we can adapt it to many different ways and needs. And to start to define that framework, I first want us to take a look back at the classical inverse problem and what its assumptions are. So the goal of geophysics is to image the subsurface geological structures based from signal caused by physical property contrast between various units. And this is done through the minimization of an objective, of an objective function phi over a model M that, repre uh, that represents the physical properties at each location of our model. And usually this objective function has two parts. The first part is the data misfit. Uh, and what it measures is how well we're reproducing the geophysical data. So we want the physical properties in the model to produce the same signal as the one we measured in the field. Uh, but this is a, a highly non-unique problem. We usually, for example, for a potential fields, we might have like, thousand data points of an, an area, but our mesh can get to a few hundred thousand or million cells pretty easily. So we need to add uh, more information to, into the inversion, which is done through uh, the second term of the objective function, which we call the regularization. And so the most common inver inversion formulation use a least square regularizer. So this is what is called a Tikhonov inversion. So this least square term measures usually two quantities. So first of all, we have a smallness. And so this term measures how, how far away your model is from a reference model MREF. So the reference here represents what we know about the subsurface before running the inversion. It's often simply a constant model, a half space, meaning that we have no a priori known structures. And then we have the smoothness part of the, uh, of the regularization, which measures spatial variation within the recovered model. And with the, with the least square formulation, this favors smooth and gradual spatial change. And so to just illustrate quickly the outcome of such inversion, uh, I'm here using uh, gravity and magnetic data generated by a synthetic model of the DO27, uh, DO27 Kimberlite pipe. So the main pipe unit that we see here in the, in the middle is characterized by a low density and it's called the PK, while the second unit HK here is the most magnetic. So from the, when we invert the gravity data, 
we obtain a density model that I show here on three slides, on a plan, plan map, north-south section, and east-west section. And I'm doing the same for the magnetic safety model obtained from magnetic data. And so what we see here is like the main density anomaly is well centered around the main pipe unit, while the magnetic anomaly is well centered also on the HK and HK unit. So, so far, so good. But we also see that they are very smooth. There is no sharp contrast to be seen. And also there is no way at the moment to link the gravity and magnetic data within the inversion. So the two models are completely independent and don't, and don't gain from each other. And now if we want to take a post-inversion classification approach to create a geological interpretation and quasi-geology model from those two outcomes. Uh, <clears throat> so, we, I'm, so for that, I'm, plot, I'm, I'm plot, plotting the scatter plot of the, of the two outcome here on the, on the left. And so we see here that we have a continuous range of value. And this is what we expect, expect from the type of inversion. Uh, and I also put on the scatter plot the true petrophysical uh, signatures of each unit yes, that I use. So we see that we are very far away from reproducing those uh, petrophysical signatures, even if we had known prior to the inversion what they, what they were, there, there is no easy way to integrate that information into the current uh, inverse problem formulation. And I also colored the point based on both the density and magnetic contrast that they have. And we see that when I reproduce that color scale on the 3D model, that any, uh, like that any geological interpretation from this uh, outcome will be highly dependent on the threshold on the threshold we choose. So this renders interpretation really, really difficult and requires a lot of expert knowledge to be done properly. And this is all expected behaviors from the least square inversion. So focusing on the least square term, term here and looking at the inverse problem from a probability, probabilistic perspective, we see that when we use uh, least square regularizers, that means that it's it's completely uh, like it's 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 completely identical to assume, assume that uh, your that your your model the parameters in your model follows a normal distribution that is centered around the reference model. So here we add bounds, but we see that's like everything diverged from the, the reference model. And so the link between uh, the objective function formulation of the inverse problem and its probabilistic, probabilistic counter, counterpart is simply through a negative logarithm. So how, how can we include physical property information in our inversion? And so that's where like the machine learning can, can play a big role. So uh, the term of interest here is really the regularization to include information about the model. So our framework builds upon this traditional formula inverse problem. We're still using an objective uh, functions with the two, two main parts, and we're not gonna touch the, the, the data misfit or except for adding several uh, misfit from different surveys at the, at the same time. So we're still gonna use uh, physics operators and sensitivity sensitivity based on partial differential equation. And but now we're interested in designing a very meaningful and informalization. So the regularization contains our prior assumptions about the geologic model. It's a measure on of, of the goodness of our model. So for two equally fitting uh, mod, um, for two equally fitting uh, models, like that fit equally the geophysical data, the way we define the regularization decide which one is most desirable. So this is an area where machine learning is especially suited as it can capture patterns and relationships that are not easily encoded through a well-defined equation. And so the goal really now becomes to design a regularization that encodes desirable features in our geophysical uh, model from uh, geology and petrophysics. And so to find a model that is uh, more appealing geologically, uh, we see that we need to make progress on two key aspects. First, we need that each pixel or cell in our mesh should have a physical property that is associated to a specific rock unit. And consequently, we also need each pixel to have a geological identifier 
that we will use to create the quasi geology model from the inversion directly. And but now because we're adding more information, like uh, we like we not not only do we need to fit the geophysical data, but we also need to measure and make sure that we are fitting the uh, petrophysical and geological observation. And so this become quite a complex problem. We have multiple data set we aim to fit at, at once. We have first the geophysical data to reproduce, and we may even have several surveys like gravity and magnetic together. And we also have uh, petrophysical and geological observation to honor that we want to honor in the recovered model. So we need, in addition to the geophysical model, we need a way to represent petrophysics and geology within our inversion. So that's why we introduce theta here, which is our petrophysical model, and Z, which represents our quasi-geology model. And it's a complicated problem to tackle all at once. So to this, our new regularization, uh, we chose to approach the problem of redefining the whole inverse problem from a probabilistic perspective and defining each step as um, a map, a map est estimation through a posterior distribution. And so this offers many advantage as most fitting problems can be expressed in such a way. So we saw, for example, that the Tikhonov inverse problem is easily represented as such uh, by using a normal distribution for the likelihood re representing the data misfit and the regularization and the prior that represent the regularization. So the PGI framework is a general and formal formulation that links and defines uh, three subset inverse problem for each quantity to be fitted. And so what we, so like this, as I say again, this is a general formulation. So what we need now is to make choices and on how we want to define each part of the functions the, and that of that formulation. And so in particular, we want to have in that formulation, we want each problem to be flexible, to adapt, to be adaptable to various situations and to formulate assumptions, to be able to formulate assumptions as well, either on the number of units or the physical properties, especially when they are not known. And so looking at the petrophysics first, so physical uh, property information can take many forms and to include that information into our inversion, we first need a way to model it and to represent it within the inversion. And so our choice for uh, of representation for that within the PGI framework uh, was to turn to uh, one very common representation in statistic, again, the normal or Gaussian distribution. So what we do here is to actually represent each geological uh, unit of interest, either expected or observed or hypothesized. And to represent its petrophysical characteristic by a Gaussian distribution. So for example, for, for the background unit, if we had several uh, sampled measured for density and magnetic susceptibility, we can uh, summarize and, uh, that information through a, a two-dimensional Gaussian that is defined by its mean and its covariance. And the covariance uh, encodes like how spread the values are and potential correlation. And we do the same for all uh, geological unit that we assume is present in our area. And then the way we bring all that information together about petrophysics is simply by a weighted summation of these different Gaussian distribution. So this is what is called a Gaussian mixture model or GMM. So this is my, going to be my representation of physical property information uh, within, the, within the inversion. So for example, for the DO27 synthetic example we had before, this is what I will obtain. I have a background unit at zero density contrast and zero magnetic susceptibility. And then I have the PK unit and the, the HK and the HK unit and with some variation around it. And so that's for the so that's for the for, so that's for the petrophysics and that proportion here I'm gonna show next but this is where uh, the geologic information is gonna come gonna be able to come in. Uh, 
But first, to complete on the petrophysics side of things, I just want to point out that GMMs are a very flexible formulation for probability distribution. They can actually fit any continuous distribution, and we can also compose them with nonlinear relationship. So here on the left, for example, I'm showing you uh, a GMM that uh, is used to approach the complex distribution uh, from uh, Randy Hankins that measured a lot of uh, density and magnetic sample all across Canada to kind of come up with like a universal uh, petrophysical distributions. And that actually required only, I believe six or seven uh, Gaussian to, very fit, to fit, really fit that data set fairly well. And now next on the geology information, again, this can come in, very, in many, many different forms and, and uh, in many different forms. So we need, again, a way to represent it within the information. And as I mentioned before, the, the proportion, the way we weighted each Gaussian in the summation is where we can include that information. So, so the way we represent the geology now, so we, we, cha we change that by uh, an expectation. So that's going to be between 0 and 1, like 0 meaning that you don't expect that particular rock unit at that location and uh, a value of one, meaning that I'm pretty sure that this is this rock unit that at that location. And then you have everything in between. So like we, now the proportions, we can make them, if we don't have any information, we can just make them the same everywhere. And so we don't have any, meaning that we don't have any prior information, but we can also, if we have ge information about ge the geology, we can vary those proportion at each uh, at different locations to uh, reflect that information. Oh, oh, very late at the very last of the talk, I'm going to even show you an example where we can try from the inversion to learn localized uh, proportion to recover uh, to recover specific uh, uh, geological structures in our inversion. Like if we had stratigraphy inversion, or if we expect a unit to be on, on top of, of another, and so on. So that's something that we can actually learn and include into that inversion. And that learning process is actually going to be very important for, for, for the next. And so, so now to link all that information together and to bring it back into the inverse, inverse problem. So what I did with that GMM is to design a new smallest priors for the geophysical inversion problem. So instead of a Gaussian priors, I use that GMM uh, to define, uh, that I defined to include petrophysical and geological information about the model within the inversion. So to walk through each component here, uh, the product sign here just means that we are looping all over all the cell of our mesh. That's our index I. The summation is over is the sum over all the ge geological uh, rock units that we assumed in our model. Then we have the proportion that uh, is that is our expectation expectation of finding a particular rock unit at a certain location. And then we have the normal distribution of that rock unit. <coughs> so we see here now that the mean of the of the petrophysics plays the same role as uh, the reference model, and then for the and then the covariance of that uh, Gaussian distribution plays actually two roles. It, it includes the covariance of each unit, so the, the petrophysical information, but it also uh, in, includes information about uh, our geophysical weight. So, for example, if like we do often for potential fields, if we wanted to add depth or sensitivity weighting, we still can uh, through that formulation. So we're not losing anything from the Tikhonov inform from the Tikhonov inversion. Act and actually, on that note, uh, what's very important to note with that no with that notation is that if you assume just that you have one rock unit, so like C is equal to one here, you get exactly the Tikhonov. Uh, formulation. So this is so this is why we consider that kind of like a, a generalization of uh, of Tikhonov because with one one work unit you go back to a lot to the Tikhonov inversion. Actually, I find that very insightful to think about what the Tikhonov inversion is. And so to define now uh, our regularization on the smallness, we do as we did before of like. Uh, in terms of the objective function is to take the negative log of that uh, probability distribution we just defined. 
And so with that, we're going to try to recover uh, petrophysical and geological information within our in inversion itself and quantitatively. And but what happens if we are, have missing information? Uh, and that's something I'm going to show later. But I mentioned a little earlier that we have learning processes, and that's those are tools are very powerful, like especially when we have missing information. So this means that we're not only dedicating PGI to uh, very well studied and ex with extensive data set areas. It's, it, it, it can be, and I'm, I want to say that it's a very powerful tool for greenfield area as well, because it's a very, like, despite we're adding quite a few parameters, this actually gives a lot of flexibility to uh, make geologic assumptions and test them against uh, the geology, geoph geophysical data at a very early stage. And so this is quite also a complex form, uh, a quite complex functions as you, as you can see when we define the, the smallness term, but uh, we can make some approximation, <coughs> some approximation that I'm gonna show, show next. So as I mentioned before, the link between a probabilistic and an ob objective function formulation is through the negative log. So if I have like a Gaussian distribution and I'm taking the negative log of that, I'm getting a quadratic function. So that's how you, so that's how you define the uh, Tikhonov and the least square formulation as, uh, <clears throat> as, a, as Gaussian in the probabilistic world. And actually, so, when, when, when our different uh, rock unit are di distinct enough, it doesn't have to be. Our implementation can handle both cases of like distinct and not distinct enough uh, units. If they are distinct enough, we can actually formulate uh, our new smallest term as a uh, least square formulation. So what I mean by distinct enough is just this. So here on the right, I'm just showing uh, a two unit uh, GMM. And so when they are very, so when the two units uh, characterizing one physical properties here uh, are very close to each other, we see that the GMM here in black is not well, uh, well, they, they don't approximate it very well. So we better use just the full, G, the full GMM. But as the two GM, as, as the two Gaussian of that GMM get apart, is that they approximate, look, they locally approximate very well the, the GMM. So what, and, so, and that's also translated into the objective function uh, counterpart of that when we take the negative log. And so we see that when the signatures are distinct enough, we can approximate very well the GMM early square formula, uh, formulation. So, what's, so what's, what happens for the smallness now is that we still have like a, a normal smallness, smallness with a weight, our model and a reference model, but now the weights and the reference model are gonna depend of your value of, of M and at which location you are. So, uh, so I'm gonna work through that, uh, work through, through that next. And to mention that, so like this is a much easier to understand formulation. And that means that we can, if you have like a compiled code, maybe you can also build the PGI around that code, uh, uh, code, code using that least square for approximation. And so now taking just a visual representation of our framework, I'm just gonna sh uh, sh show how this, uh, this frameworks work. So this, uh, so this is like, so this is uh, an iterative framework. So each of the three inverse subset inverse problem are solved psych psychic psychically. So our first, so the first problem is uh, so the geophysical inversion stays the same as before, and we're just gonna take the least square uh, approximation from now. So it stays very the same. We have an in as input the geophysical data, and the prior information we include in that problem is uh, the, the weights and the reference model, and we're minimizing the same objective function as before. And so what and what we're gonna do is just take a single a single step of the inverse problem. So inver like the geophysical inversion is often uh, iterative, iterative uh, problem in itself. So here we're just gonna take one step, one iteration of that problem and get an updated model M. So then once we have, it, uh, once we have this uh, updated M, we go to the petrophysical characterization. And so I'm gonna sh show you uh, an example just after of an application of that uh, 
of that petrophysical characterization process. But basically, what I want to do here with this step is to be able to update the prior, prior petrophysical information. So I might have some, uh, some information from lab measurement or borehole measurement, uh, and, and I can use that information in the geophysical inversion itself. But what if I don't have this information? And so, or, or, or maybe I'm not sure about that information and I don't have much confidence in it. And so what I want to be able to do is to learn and really learn a petrophysical distribution from both what I know from the petrophysics, but also from the geoph geophysical data itself. And so this is done through uh, an algorithm that is called uh, the a map expectation maximization or MAPEM. And what it does here is basically uh, an average of your prior assumptions and what you see in the geophysical model. So, so that's what I show here on that, uh, on that figure on the right. So, at any stage of the inversion, if I have my geophysical model uh, represented as the blue histogram here, and I've input a particular prior distribution for my petrophysics as in form of the GMM, so that's our my uh, so that's our theta petrophysical model representation with, as a GMM. So we can try to learn and average to distribution. And so the outcome of the map EM is going to be this, uh, this black line. And you can weight each, each side uh, as you want. So if you're, pretty if you're very confident in your priors, you can give a lot of weight to the priors so that it, your distributions basically stay fixed. Or, you, or, or maybe you don't have a very good priors and you just want to learn from the geophysical inversion alone and so then you can give all the weights to the to the, to the histogram and then the, the our pm outcome will just follow the the blue histogram and so from that step we uh, uh, we get a new gmm with updated mean and uh, covariance and global proportion and so then we then use that uh, new gmm as our input for the geolog uh, geological identification and so the input is the GMM and our model M, and we have some prior information about where our lock, lock work units are located. And for this problem now, we're just gonna take the very sim simplest way of like assi assigning each cell its most likely work unit. So what the way it's done is that uh, we it's it has two parts. So like it's based on your prior expectation of finding a work unit somewhere, and based on the physical property at that location. So for example, if we look at the uh, geophysical model M here with our uh, GMM, like all that side will be classified as unit one and all that side will be classified as unit two. And then how we define the reference model is uh, by the mean of the most likely unit at that location and the smallest weight are the as, as a covariance. And so then we have an updated reference model and weights. And then we use those updated reference model and weights for our next iteration of the geophysical inversion. And we just keep cycling over that. And so that's how the PGI framework works. And so to show you in action on a very simple problem here. So this is a 1D linear problem where I want to compare the Tikhonov inversion and the PGI and the PGI inversion. So the, we see with the Tikhonov inversion, which like the, so like the black line is a true model. The blue line is our reference model. So it's in the Tikhonov inversion, it stays the same. And the, and the red line is uh, our recovered geophysical model M. And so we see like now, if we look at, so here the, in, in black, I have the data misfit decrease of the, of the Tikhonov model. So we see that we, uh, we're iterating and, and updating the model until we reach uh, a target misfit for the geophysics that is based, uh, that, is, <clears throat> that is dependent on the number of that data. And when we look at the smallness term of that, of that model, we see actually that it, it increased. So that's kind of the, how the inverse problem works. You decrease the data misfit, but in counterpart, the regularization value increase. And now to compare that with PGI, what we see, what we see is that at each iteration, we're indeed updating the reference, mo uh, the, the reference model to uh, transfer the, the knowledge from the, from the geophysical model to the, to, to the <coughs> from the geophysical model to the reference model. And when we look at its convergence curve here, 
we see that like the we have the we also decreasing the data misfit, but now looking also uh, also at its regularization in blue right here, we see that it first increased, but then it decreased until it's also reached a target misfit. And that's also a very important part is that now in, in with PGI, our smallness term is a misfit. So smallness is a measure on the, of the misfit of our model with the petrophysics and geology information. And as it's as a misfit, we then need also a target value for that to, to measure like, so that tells us if we fit our data or not. And so very, it's a very similar formulation as a geophysical target misfit, but this time it depends on the number of uh, parameters in your model. So that number N is actually here the number of cell, but if you have uh, several physical properties, that will be the number of cell times the number of physical properties. And why we are on convergence curve, I just want to have one slide on that and on convergence con con uh, consideration. So we have now quite a intricate objective functions. We like we have a data misfit and I'm showing here that in my also, like when we do in joint inversion, we have several data misfits that we want and we want to fit each of the geophysical survey. We don't want one misfit for all of them. We want one for each of them. And then we have our smallness term and then we have uh, obviously, the, we keep the smoothness for each of the physical properties. And so here I'm showing you a very, just a very typical convergence curve for a joint inversion problem with uh, PGIs. So this was only for like a, a gravity and magnetic joint inversion over a two block, mo two block model. So, so it's not, the model is not very important here, but it's just to show you a very, um, typical convergence curve and how and how we work with that intricate objective functions. And the approach we took here is to uh, is a dynamic update of all the parameters throughout the inversion. So by monitoring the, uh, the, the objective function, and we took an heuristic approach to reweight uh, along the way. So we see that the, for the for the data misfit FIDES, we are decreasing the gravity and magnetic misfit along the way. And same as for the linear problem I showed before, uh, for the small for the smallness value, we we first increase it, and then we like it. We slowly also decreasing it till it should target misfit. And and for for beta, it's still as the normal inverse problem where we usually cool down uh, the beta value uh, to decrease the so to decrease the. Uh, to decrease the importance of the regularization and give more weight to the data misfit. And so that's, and so this is still valid. But now the two values that are really changing is that uh, it, it can be very hard to, to, uh, to weight properly two data misfit together when you're doing joint inversion. So what we do here, we, we start from an initial guess, but as we see here that we started to fit the, uh, the gravity data first. So what we, did, what we do in, the, in joint inversion is that once, once the survey is fit, we're gonna decrease in its importance in the, in the data, in the objective function and increase the importance of the others. And we're gonna do, do that until both data misfit are below the target. And similarly for the for alpha s, which is which now weights our petrophysical and geological misfit, once uh, once all the, the the geophysical data are fit, we're gonna increase in the importance to give more importance to the petrophysical keep the geophysical data still uh, at their target. And so that's how this, we so that's how we iteratively weight the functions to to reach several data uh, several at the same time. And so now we have that now that we have handles on the geology and the petrophysics encoded within the geophysical inversion regularization itself, this opens up a lot of different use for this framework to adapt the inverse problem to the geology question. So what I would really like to do now is to show you various examples example of application of PGI, both on synthetic and field example, and, and how that can be used, especially to make geologic assumptions and test them quantitatively against the geophysical data. And uh, just a very first example, finally, an, em an empty example, sorry, it's so simple. <laughs> so this, uh, and this is just to highlight uh, on this one that PGI is not Forcefully to just recover blocky models. 
like the covariance matrix in the GMM measures on how spread out you want the, your uh, petrophysics to be for each unit. So what we what we did in that empty model is that we have a synthetic uh, 1D model where we have a blocky unit and a smooth unit. And so the blue line here is what we what we recover with the Tikhonov inversion. So actually the smooth is very well done and the blocky, uh, we don't get that block, much of that blockiness. But with PGI inversion, we see like we can have like a sharp uh, background unit. We can have the sharp uh, resistive unit. And then for the, for the conduct, smooth conductive unit, we can define a very wide covariance. And we see that when we run that inversion, the blockiness of the, conductive, of the resistive unit is well recovered as well as keeping the smoothness of the conductive unit. And so in the description of the framework, I've defined, I've defined to use that map EM algorithm where we can learn a petrophysical uh, distribution from the, geophysical uh, from the geophysical data. And so this is, this is a very important and very useful tool like, so that we, we can work with PGI with partial, incomplete, or biased information. And I want to illustrate that here on a simple example, which is a 2D uh, DC over uh, two cylinders in the in the background. So one cylinder is conductive and the other one is resistive. So when we invert that, the that the DC data acquired over this true model, that's what we will obtain from the Tikhonov in, uh, inversion. So we very recognize here like the Tikhonov inversion. So we definitely see features that are more uh, conductive and more resistive, but we have also a very uh, smooth. Uh, histogram that has the characteristics, characteristics, characteristics of, the Go, of the Gaussian. Now, if I run PGI and imagine, I imagine like in that case, I imagine that I give it the true uh, pet, and, and full petrophysical information. So I give it the, the GMM in black here, which has the true uh, variance and mean of each of the cylinders and background. And we see that running the PGI algorithm does a very good job at recovering everything like it fits the geophysical data and we see that the petrophysical signatures are very well recovered and we get the kind of the right structures in the re in the recovered model but the and that last row is actually the one that we are most interested in here is that in that example i assume that we didn't know about the petrophysics we just look at the ticon of inversion and like oh like we have a conductive unit and a resistive unit but I don't know what their contrast are. So let, we use the petrophysical characterization here to recover a GMM. And we just give all the weight on the geophysical uh, model. Like our prior, our prior initial guess have no importance at all. And so the only assumption, assumptions more that we are making here compared to the Tikhonov inversion is that there is, there, there is three rock in it. And so that's a very powerful tool to do with PGI is that you can just run an inversion with an assumed number of units and trying to learn the petrophysical signatures along the way. And so this type of uh, geologic assumptions will be very hard to do purely in the Tikhonov inversion, which as I say, is basically the case of, we assume there is one work unit, just, just one. So like that, and so like here in that example, we see that we, we, we recover very well, like three distinct rock units, and we kind of get the right shape, especially at the top. Like the sphere are a bit over, uh, definitely overestimated, and we are under, uh, underestimating the true uh, petrophysical contrast, but we're still making a good job at recovering something dis distinct, and we're getting close to the, getting closer to the true GMM. And just to start, show a first example of uh, using the geology information in the local proportions of the GMM here is that I we can imagine, for example, if we had boreholes through that, maybe we still have, haven't taken petrophysical measurement, but maybe we've seen that those anomalous units are only found at specific depths. So if we can add that information about the depths where those units are found, we can add that information through the prior expectation, meaning that we don't expect those units to be passed uh, seven meters or, and, or to be above two meters. And so that's, this is what we will obtain now when adding that information. So we see that we, the geology information is, uh, is respected in the final model. And also now that we're still learning the GMM and actually 
we did a small step towards the true mean, uh, the true mean again. Like the, the, those contrasts are a little higher than the, in that one. So by adding info information, we give a little more information to the learning of the GMM as well. <clears throat> so to show uh, to show PGI on a single physics problem, an environmental problem before jumping to multiphysics, I want to you, show you. Uh, a field case study that we did at uh, Bukpunan. So this is uh, along the Murray River in, uh, in in Australia, and the goal of that of that study, well, it was done many many years before, but we wanted to test PGI on 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 that data set. So it's like the goal is to reduce ambiguity for saline contamination characterization by EN survey. So the problematic here is that irrigation from agriculture has led to the salinization of flood soil, and the goal is to determine if the fresh water is of the river is charging the aquifer, so that's the LC scenario, or if the saline, saline aquifers is actually going into the river. So like we're getting salt in the river and that's in the not so healthy scenario. And the method we use for, for that is to invert like a resolve, uh, so uh, airborne EM uh, frequency domain EM survey uh, with a 1D laterally constrained inversion. So we now coupled a PGI with this laterally constrained uh, inversion uh, process. And so to just show the PGI as a tick off inversion first, we actually took the way of um, starting the inversion both from a conductive and a resistive background. And uh, what we saw is that we were getting actually a lot of, even with the laterally constrained, we were getting a lot of structures in the inversion. But worst of all, those structures did not match when we move, when we changed the reference model. And that was very problematic because like I'm showing here like a, a ratio of the two Tikhonov models. So yellow means that they, they are in agreement with each other. Orange means that there is a factor two between the two recovered conductivity and black uh, that there is like a factor of 10 between the two conductivities. And that's what's really makes the difference between are we getting fresh water or saline water in that case. So this makes the interpretation complicated. And so we tried here to run also PGI and we chose to put three units uh, because that fitted what was seen in the, in the borehole and you know, in other studies where we had uh, fresh water on top, saline waters at the, at the bottom and in the middle, we had a brackish intermediate region. And we did the same thing of starting from a conductive and a resistive background. And same as for the DC example that I just showed before, we, we just said there is three units and we just let the, uh, the, the algorithm run and completely learn from the, pet, petro, from the geophysics a suitable GMM. And what was really nice here is that even though proportion uh, varies a lot, like those big spikes mainly come from basically the padding. So like, we're, we're like so the most important unit is the one uh, where we started from, but the mean of both GMM are actually very similar. And the structures that we recover close to the near surface, well, first of all, we have a lot less structures, like we get getting things that are actually more, like more smooth, but like more, more co coherent. And when we compare the two results, they are actually, even though we started from widely different points, they are much more in agreement with each other. And when we look at our model and the, uh, and the interpretation that were ma was made at the time on, 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 the, on that case study, we, uh, we, we fit what they found out about the LC or not so LC scenario. So <clears throat> this was very encouraging to find things that like, even like now that by adding just the three unit assumptions that the starting model did not have much importance because we are basically learning it along the way. Now. We're compensating for our lack of knowledge for that through the petrophysical characterization. And so now uh, jumping into uh, the, the multiphysics. So uh, this is a multiphysics uh, case study that I did uh, completing on the DO27 uh, Kimber light pipe and really focusing on the on the potential field uh, there. So to 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 uh, to recapitulate, so the DO27 Kimber light pipe it's a diamondiferous uh, pipe in the Northwest Territory of Canada, and it's embedded into a granitic host rock and overlaid by some uh, some till. And, and there are several units of interest that I show here uh, through the geology model that was built 
uniquely from the borehole. So that will serve as our benchmark for judging of the geophysical result, but this is uh, so th but this is not a perfect model either. Like the main pipe is well sampled while outside of it, a lot less. And so the main unit of the pipe here is the, that uh, pyroclastic kimberlite, PK, and this is a diamantiferous unit. And it's characterized by its low density. There is also a small volcanoclastic kimberlite, VK here, with similar characteristics. So we're just gonna consider those two units together. And then we have this ipabisal unit, HK, uh, characterized by a very strong remnant magnetic response. And so for this study, I'm going to focus on the available uh, potential field survey. So I'm, I'm not going to look at the uh, airborne electromagnetic, for example. And so to, to, to walk through the, the data set that I had, we first had this uh, airborne uh, magnetic survey from a VTEM survey. And what we can definitely clearly see here is that the main magnetic unit, even though we are very far north, is not centered around the HK unit. And that was a, a, a sign that uh, there was strong remanence in the area. And there was like a fairly strong negative also to the north of it. So, so that was identified in previous uh, study. And then we had uh, the ground gravity and where we see uh, the, it's well centered around the main, main pipe, but we also have this northern extension of, uh, of the, the, the gravity anomalies that we're gonna come back later on because that was something that we found that did not quite match with what we knew about the geology before starting the study. And then finally, there is uh, the uh, nearborne gravity gradiometry. Uh, so to start with the least square, to start with the least square uh, inversion here, this is what we obtained. So not going to uh, go too much on that, but this is very, uh, this is very close to the to the synthetic I was showing. One thing maybe that to mention that's more very more important is that because we have remnants here uh, for the magnetic inversion, we're actually going to use a magnetic vector inversion, meaning that we're going to invert uh, not only for the magnetic amplitude but also for uh, basically for the three components of the magnetic vectors to, uh, to, to have this orientation and amplitude. And again, as for the synthetic, we see that if we try to build a geolo geology model from the, this result, uh, it's going to be very complicated because of the continuous strand and value. And also, I want to point out that I'm already doing here the uh, ground gravity and uh, gravity gradometry inversion together because they depend on the same physical properties. So they are easily merged even in the Tikhonov process. So let's start by including some physical property information. So uh, starting with the density, what we had, uh, we had this cross section from the drill hole campaign report that showed a very strong linear correlation between depth and density contrast. And so to include that information about that linear trend, uh, I, what I did was to actually include the elevation in my GMM. So it's a fixed parameters and not, it's not gonna change, like it's gonna be fixed for each cell, but that allows us like, we see that we can define the covariance so that we have this tilted uh, distribution to represent that linear trend for the, for the PK unit. And when we look at the background unit, we see like it's just vertical and very, and very wide, meaning that the elevation has no impact on the background value. And, HK is actually included in, for the density is included here because from the sample we had, it did not show any, any significant density contrast with the background. And in terms of the magnetic, we took two sources to define our GMM. So first we had like a few 10 for all units in a, uh, from a, from the lab that were measured both for magnetic and remanence. So that sample gave us uh, a way to define the amplitude of the, of the remanence. And for the orientation, we actually took uh, an estimation that was obtained by the previous uh, 2017 study. And so from that amplitude and orientation information, we now define a three-dimensional GMM for the mag that summarizes information for uh, the, the, mag the, the magnetic vectors in X, Y, and Z. And same here, like uh, the H, the PK and VK unit appeared as like very, uh, with very low 
magnetic to uh, HK. So from the magnetic point of view, now it's uh, PK and VK that's included within the background. And so to start with just a single physics PGI now, uh, this is what we obtained with uh, inverting the gravity and gravity gradiometry survey with the petro petrophysical information. And so we see here that we're getting something that's very reasonable. Like, so at the near surface, the outline of the pipe is very well recovered. And we see that with depths, that linear trend that we prescribe is also very well recovered and respected in the inversion. What we're going to have to come back to is that, as mentioned, we had this not an extension of the of the gravity data to the north here, and that, that shows us a very strong extension of the pipe way, way far north. And we have some, we have some uh, borehole here, so like that doesn't seem to, to match, but we're gonna come back to that. For the, magne for, the, for the magnetic survey, we see that we were able to recover uh, very, very well like the top of the VK unit with the correct orient orientation and uh, amplitude. But this single physics doesn't do the whole trick because when I combine those two, those two model together, I see that I have a, str a strong uh, overlap of, the, of, of low density and high susceptibility uh, in, in, the, in the model. And that doesn't correspond to any known, uh, known rock unit in the area. So, we, so now we have to turn to uh, multi-physics inversion to solve that. And so to exclude, to exclude the way to have both low density and high magnetic susceptibility. And so that's what we, so that's what we, so that's what we run. Now we have a multi-physics PGI with uh, five parameters, so five dimensional GMM with density, the three components of the magnetic vectors and elevation. And we fit all three geophysical surveys that we presented and we were producing all the petrophysical signatures that we are, that we prescribe. And so this is quite a major uh, improvement uh, compared to before, as there is no overlap of high density contrast and magnetic contrast anymore. And so, and looking at the magnetic inversion, because we increase the size of the dimensionality of our GMM, we are now able to distinguish the magnetic response from PK, from PK and the magnetic response from uh, HK. And we see that we're able within the same inversion to recover two orientation, two different orientation for the magnetic vectors, one for the remanence and one that is oriented as an induced field for the PK, PK unit. And the orientation, like the PK unit is well recovered at the top, but we are, it's actually a flat block. We don't get any structures. Why we saw it from the geological model, it's a dipping unit. And again, we have this not an extension of the pipe here that doesn't seem to match our borehole. So the problem we have with that model now is a geologic uh, of the is a geologic problem. We are not even with the multiphysics and petrophysics, we are not quite fitting our observation in borehole. So and we saw here like there is a lot less borehole outside of the pipe nose, but with the few boreholes they had. They met some. Uh, they met some kimberlite at the near surface, and we see that we have this smooth uh, gravity anomaly right here at the near the surface. So now we can start to use PGI and really use its powerful uh, tools as a geologic assumptions making. And so the assumption we're going to make is that maybe there is another like a, dist uh, a distinct kimberlite uh, facies outside of the pipe that have a very different density signatures. And so this is what we, how we, we get that. We just, go, we just got back to the gravity alone because that was really the characteristic uh, survey for, the, for that one. So that was our original result with gravity. So first of all, uh, using both the, the borehole and, the, and what we were seeing in the inversion, we basically uh, limit the, the pipe occurrence to, um, to the south portion of the of the survey, meaning that we use the local proportion here, basically saying that the pipe unit is can only appears in the south of the mesh and north of the mesh it cannot go. So like what's happening here is that basically the north of the mesh just revert to a normal like just revert to a normal Tikhonov inversion because it only sees a background. So that's also the a nice way uh, the nice behavior of PGI and we have this smooth anomaly, and then the next step after that is we added a conjectured near surface kimberlite unit that we call PK minus because it, it's, it still seems to be very similar to that. So 
using the using the fact that elevation was already part of the GMM, we we limited to the near surface and we ran a couple of inversions just to decide on suitable density mean and variance and and so on. And so this is what we obtain. And you see here already is that we are using the same we're using the same gravity data. We're using the same petrophysical information for the background and the PK unit. And now we are just making assumption and testing, testing them against the gravity. And you see how we can change the model quite uh, substantially based on that. And now with that final unit, we were saying that like that near surface unit that we just, I mean, we just, we, we, we we're just assuming things right now. And it's starting to fit a lot more the, uh, the geological and, and data that we have. Like, we don't have like borehole in that section, but there was one here that was mapping that. So like it's actually like so it's actually quite good to be kind of like inter starting to interpolate on the geologic model on that. And so obviously now that we define that unit from the gravity survey, we added that back to the geology uh, to the multiphysics inversion and to obtain this uh, information. And what was very cool about that too is that. Well, the mag we still recover different information. So for the mag of that additional unit, we just gave it the same uh, signatures as the main PK unit. And even though now, like the plate part of PK, of HK is not as well recovered, it's going much deeper. But actually, this is something that I'm going to show on the synthetic letters. But what's happening is, and what's very cool is that I'm actually now getting uh, a much better uh, structures for the top of that uh, HK unit. So I'm, I'm actually, we're actually seeing the dipping in the 3D model now. And that was not visible before adding that unit. So we are definitely gaining more information just by making some assumptions that seems to fit very well with, with, the, with the data. So we've gained a lot, a lot uh, we've gained on the structural on that. And so, to conclude for that example, so we started by like uh, by showing that inference from inversion with single data set can be deficient and that by using PGI, we were able to fit all the potential field data and physical property information and to ma make meaningful geologic assumptions to further refine our model. And so this case study was a great example on how to integrate extensive information and formulate increasingly complex assumption about the, the geology. But what if we did not know the petrophysical signatures to start with? And well, again, the PGI frameworks allow to make assumptions about the number of units and the petrophysical signatures. And we can use again the petrophysical characterization to make such assumptions. So let's formulate one on the synthetic now. So that was the that was the Tikhonov inversion result from the synthetic that I showed before. And what we can see from that from this inversion, as we say, like the magnetic and density uh, anomalies were not centered around the around the at the same location. And so, one assumption we can make from that from the, if we had those two outcome, and but not knowing the the petrophysics was like, well, there is probably like let's assume there is three units here. Like there is one for the background for sure. Then I have one unit that's mainly responsible for the for the density, uh, for the gravity response, but doesn't participate much to the magnetic. And then we have a third unit, which is mostly responsible for the magnetic response, but doesn't participate much to the density, to the gravity response. And we can actually make that assumptions within PGI, and we can learn a, st a stable petrophysical distribution with those characteristics. And so that's what we're making here. Like we're using the petrophysical characterization to learn under certain constraints. So we have a, a, a back, uh, we have a background unit, and we just fixed, fixed its con contrast at zero. And we have one unit that uh, we uh, we expect it's going to have a low density, but we don't know the, the we don't know the contrast. So we're going to learn that contrast, but we fix its magnetic contrast to zero. So to promote it to have a low magnetic response. And then the third unit is the reverse. We, we suppose it's going to have a high magnetic response, but we don't know by how much. So we let the algorithm learn the, its magnetic mean, but we fix its density contrast at zero, mean density contrast at zero, so to favor a low contrast. So it's not true. It's not true compared to other things because we see that both PK, our PK here and HK unit in our synthetic have both density and magnetic contrast, but that's actually getting close enough to the reality. And so what we see here, I'm showing just how much the mean are changing at iteration. So we started from just 
uh, no, uh, like no, no knowledge. And then at each iteration, we see that the, uh, so the mean of unit, of unit two here, like so, so the density contrast is increasing up to like about minus 0 0.35. So half of the true contrast, while it's, uh, while it's magnetic contrast, contrast say, stays to zero. And for the magnetic unit, we see that we learn its contrast and the contrast increase with iteration. And again, about half of the true uh, thing, uh, of the true con of the true petrophysical value, while its density contrast stays to zero, like the mean one. Like it's not the true one, but we keep it fixed to just promote those features in the inversion. And what's very cool about that is that I'm definitely seeing that from that joint inversion, without knowing the petrophysics, the top of the HK unit is again like I'm getting the the orientation right, and it's I'm get I'm getting a lot of information about the structures. And as for the true, uh, for the field case study, I see that at the bottom, I'm getting a lot of smears and like going much at depth. So I don't recover the plate things, but the structure is right. So that gives me confidence into the real uh, field case study as well of, for recovering the structures of about the HK. And next one, I, I have a movie actually about that. So like, I'm just, I just want to show you uh, dynamically, how that iterate, how that how, how that inversion works, and again, this inversion stops when both petro, when all the geophysical data and the petrophysical uh, misfit are reached. So we see, like here, like we are the, the mean of those two clusters are moving and are basically let, try, uh, updated at each iteration, learning from the scatter plot, and so that's how the, the inversion runs. Maybe one more time, it's a so I'm sure. <clears throat> and, we, and so we see that the final step are really dedicated to just cluster things. And so we match our, uh, so we reach our uh, petrophysical misfit of having things that are very clustered around each mean. And Almost final point of the talk. Uh, I'm just gonna sh uh, just want to talk very briefly about the latest research I've been doing. So I've talked a lot about uh, manually setting the local pop local uh, local geology information, and we've talked a lot about uh, very more much more advanced tool on making petrophysic in, in, uh, petrophysic information and assumptions and letting the algorithm learn about that. But uh, can we learn a bit about the geology also as well and like. So some of the limit of the current implementation that I showed is that we're doing a cell by cell classification, but geology, info geology information is much more special information. So if we wanted to have like true, like geology information that we not don't set at very specific location, we will need to share information across neighbors. And that's not what we're doing right now. So because con continuity and orientation right now are ensured by the smoothness, but that applies on the physical properties on the geophysical model. Here, I want to add that information to the quasi geology model itself. Like, again, I have three values in PGI that I'm interested in in the output. I have the geophysical model M, I have my petrophysical model theta, and I have the quasi geology model Z. And so, as I say again, PGI is a, it's a general and formal framework. And then I can just change which part of the, how I define each part of the, of the, of the function. And so what I did in a recent uh, SCG abstract, and there is also a full online seminars on it online if you want to check it out later. So that's why I don't want to talk too much about it now. But basically, uh, in, uh, using image implementation tools to implement geology rule within the inversion, meaning that now when I build the quasi-geology model at each iteration and at each loop of that PGI framework, that uh, I'm using image implementation tools so that the reference model that I'm building follow certain characteristics. So this is starting to make more advanced geological part of the inversion. And so really starting to make it like that. The geology modeling is influencing the, the, the inversion, but also the reverse, having the geophysical inversion affect the geological modeling. So to, for, to get to that goal, I'm, I, I, like, uh, I used the uh, generalization of GMM called the GMM MREF for uh, Markov random field. And so basically in that framework, you're trying to learn 
uh, everywhere localized weights so that it favors uh, smoothness in the classification. So we see that for, if we had an original image here and I'm using a GMM classification, so meaning that I'm classifying things pixel by pixel, I'm gonna get things that kind of bit getting a bit noisy. Well, with an image segmentation one, you're trying to get full areas that are like more consistent. So like, for example, if we look at the, at the, at the, like the sign here, like we're getting something that's much more smooth uh, across, across it. And so I actually use this tool uh, on a simple DC 2D example again. So that was the true model. So with a three layered earth and uh, with a dike and a fault. And this is what we were getting with the uh, Tikhonov inversion. And running the, the PGI that I showed so far, this is what I was getting. And I was, it's not satisfactory. Like, we defin like the first layer is fine and the background is fine as well, but we've lost the continuity of the resistive unit. We are only getting pockets and the dike unit is only uh, up at the surface and way down with just recovering that same, the same conductivity as the unit at the surface. And so what we did is to use this uh, image segmentation tool to to add geology rule and uh, within the inversion. So like adding ge uh, geology modeling. So not localized information, but just stating rules when we build the reference model. So we added a unit continuity rule and we also added the stratigraphic orders. Well, we basically said that the top unit and the background unit cannot be in contact with each other. So that's how the, dense, the resistivity unit is added in between. And then we added also structural orientation for the dike to try to cluster that and favor, favor the dike at depth. And this is what we are getting. And in the middle of the survey, it's like we're doing actually a very good job. So now like the continuity of the resistive unit is much better. We still see the, the, the fault and the dike is much more recovered as well. On the side, uh, it's a DC survey. So like we have a lot less sensitivity on this side with the electrodes here. And actually here on that side, like those were pretty strong rules. So like we had, I'd actually like add competing orders between what the geophysics was telling and, and the geological and the geological modeling, just meaning that we like you would have needed to update the model outside of the of the survey to get something good. So like we see here, like it's we have a balance to make also the, the, uh, in the surveys. And last part of the talk and uh, I want to let, talk a little less about what I do, uh, but much more about the whole uh, Simpeg community here. So for, for those of you that may be not familiar, so Simpeg, it's an open source uh, Python package for simulation and parameter estimation in, geo, in geophysics. So it's a full package dedicated to geophysical inversion that is freely and publicly available online. And it got started at uh, UBC, but we have a growing body of contributors from uh, both academic and uh, and uh, industry uh, pa partners so i'm just showing you here some uh, some that are jointly reg regularly on our weekly meetings and this everything that i showed you so far has been done in python with that package and i'm super grateful to that whole community and and in, the, in, in my last year as a postdoc, my uh, focus was really on trying to get that PGI code out there and being used by other people. So uh, it was a very big community effort that we made that, and we succeeded as a group to make this PGI code as part of the main distribution of Simpeg since May 2021. So that, that's the first uh, multi-physics uh, joint inversion tool that's been done in Simpeg. And I'm so also glad to say that I believe before the end of the year or early in January, we're gonna have uh, more uh, joint inversion tools coming in and especially a uh, cross gradient implementation by Xiao Long here that is working on his PhD with Jia at uh, the University of Houston. And why is this open source thing is really important to me is really like I'm starting to see my code used by others and, and that's and I think I hope it can make an impact at some point. So I'm showing you here a slide that was sent to me by uh, Michael Mitchell. So he's doing his uh, postdoc as a USGS in California uh, under the su supervision of Jared Peacock and his project involves uh, imaging the mag magmatic plumbing of the Clear Lake volcanic field. So this is a uh, a volcanic field that is located about 100 kilometers north of uh, San Francisco. And there is a large 
And there has been a number of earthquakes recorded in the area. And we have geysers and like uh, pipe, uh, hot, et cetera. So like this is a very geologically active region. And there is a strong magnetic, there is a strong gravity law uh, in that area as well. So the big question that they have is that, is there a partially melt body bet between the geysers and Mount Anna? Uh, and so they want to use the gravity data to, to, uh, to, to answer that question. And the way they use PGI then is that between a partial melt and a, and a crystallized body, there is an important density contrast. So they are using PGI to, uh, to test uh, different density, contr uh, density contrasts that they prescribe from their knowledge of petrophysics at different depths and trying to answer that question, like if, if, the, if the gravity data can only be explained by a partial met. And that has huge implication for uh, the as, hazard around the area. And they're also in the process of collecting empty data in the region. So for the second year of the project, they plan on using PGI to jointly invert gravity and empty together. So I'm looking forward to see what they are up to. And uh, also here at GIF, uh, I'm very glad to see that uh, it's being picked up by others and uh, I, that PGI is still gonna be worked on uh, in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in the future. So this, and so there is a project on that for mapping carbon sink resources through a my tax with, between the UBC GIF and the uh, Mira Geoscience. So the idea here is that in addition to reducing anthropogenic emission of CO2, geologic sequestration is an attractive approach to slow climate change. And so one mechanism of geologic storage is through carbon mineralization. Serpentinized rock and ultramafic rocks contain minerals that will react with CO2 in a carbonation reaction and convert it to carbonated mineral. This is effectively a permanent CO2 storage. And so this shares a lot of similarities, similarities with a cap fix uh, test site in Iceland that is injecting CO2 in basalt that some of you might have heard of in the news recently because they increased the a lot of their, their production recently. And uh, so, Greg's Depot Group here at UBC uh, are doing a fantastic work at locating potential sites for those ultramafics and characterizing, characterizing the geochemistry and petrophysics of, the, of those rocks across, across British Columbia. So they've, they've, mapped, they've decided for a couple of sites. And especially, we've been looking at the Dekar site that I'm showing here. And so you see that from their petrophysical work here, uh, using LOI as a proxy for alteration, we see there is a strong correlation between the LOI and the density, uh, density but also magnetic susceptibility. And so we're just submitting the first uh, proof of concept of the use of PGI in that, in, in that context. So what we, can, what we can contribute here is that geophysics can play a huge role to locate, not only to locate, but also to delineate and estimate the volume of potentially reactive rocks. And using the PGI for petrophysics as well, we hope that we can remotely characterize the state of alteration. And so here I'm showing here a synthetic example that we use that uh, mimic, uh, simplify obviously the Dekar site. And so this has been worked on by uh, a lot of people here at the UBC, uh, UBC group. And so for those that uh, are wondering about uh, SIMPEG in general or PGI in more particularly, as I say, we're making a lot of effort on uh, getting people on board. And so here I'm just listing a couple of resources on how to use or where to start uh, SIMPEG. So SIMPEG, it's a, it's a Python pa uh, package. So there is some scripting, but we have done a lot of work on installation and documentation. And there's been also a lot of work done uh, to have it installed through Anaconda, which is a Python packa uh, pack package manager in Python for those of you who know. And on the PGI side, uh, I've made uh, several uh, online code tutorials online, an online gallery, but also a lot of the examples that I've showed today are reproducible on the cloud. So you don't even need to have Python installed in your own machine. And so in summary, uh, we showed that analyzing various data sets can really give information that is not av available in any of the individual analysis. And that joint analysis uh, leads to better results than merging just several uh, an individual analysis. And so PGI is really a general framework for inco incorporating various 
uh, prior knowledge and also uh, work with partial data or even uh, make uh, geologic assumptions and to really at the end tell us the inversion to the geologic question that we are asking it. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Thibault. Absolutely wonderful. I, I really, really like the way that you're the way you're doing your work, but also making it all available to the community is, is absolutely tremendous. So um, open now to questions. We we had one long question from uh, from Pavel, but he asked at the end of his question that you, you reply to it by letter. So I'll, I'll email that question to you. Um, and I'll wait for, we have no other questions in now. Maybe I'll just ask a, ask a question. And that is um, how, you know, how restrictive is it that, that you assume a Gaussian distribution of your parameters? Uh, because often we see in our, uh, in our data that uh, our parameters our observations are not Gaussian distributed, the longer tail than Gaussian. So it's a way far back, but yeah, like it's a, it's a, it's a good question. And I mean, um, uh, like, uh, so what I would say is that uh, a, a few things, um, like the Gaussian assumption, uh, like in some way, when you look at probability, it's actually the minimum assumptions. When you, when you, when you don't, know much about a, a, a distribution assuming that it's gaussian is actually the minimum uh, minimum assumption so that means that you're not introducing many much bias when you do that but then obviously like as you say things are not gaussian and i don't I haven't measured and how how much that that plays a role but like also how like there is a question of scaling or like with geophysics, we're like looking sometime at, at like at full blocks of like 100 meters by 100 meters by 100 meters or even bigger. And sometimes when we measure uh, uh, so samples, it's like sometimes a rock a hand sample or even smaller. So I imagine that like uh, like so I'm imagining there is some scaling things as well, and that and with the averaging that makes that the Gaussian assumption works in general. Okay, and if really want, you want to make it to make to assume something very, very different, as I say, like you can, like uh, we can, we can just ditch the least square approximation and uh, actually use the GMM to as to uh, to fit any condition continuous distribution and try to run to run with that. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, just a comment from uh, from Dennis Woods. I'll just repeat so it's in the in the record. <laughs> Thanks for a fantastic talk, Thibault. I'm picking up the pieces of my brain off the floor because you just blew my mind again. <laughs> what an amazing future for geophysics and geology. So yeah, thanks, Dennis. Um, we have a question from Andrea Balza Morales. Uh, thank you for your presentation. What are the consequences of assuming the wrong amount of rock units in PGI? Can this be unperceived, assuming that the phys petrophysical relationships isn't clear? Uh, so, I, I see, I see two potential part of that question, and I'm not sure when, which one she is referring to. So I'm just gonna do the, uh, I'm just gonna do both. So, uh, for the amount of rock unit. I'm like the first way, like the first parameter I think of is yes, yeah, the number of work units I'm putting in the in the in, in the inversion, and the consequence is what is as I say, what is actually nice with PGI is that uh, when you don't have a work unit or when you're not identifying another unit, it behaves exactly as as Tikhonov, and so that's what we were saying, for example, in. Um, if I do that, do you still see my uh, screen or not? Yes. Okay, perfect. So oops, that's going to be easy. So like that was, for example, this example where like 
in the north section, there was not identifying the pipe. And so like in that example, like it basically just reverted to a ticon of in, in, inversion. And then you can build up on that and like seeing that you still have like specially coherent smooth features and try to add another rock unit for that. And I have actually a couple of slides in the, the appendix to also illustrate that, that I've been working on for like a, more like a tutorial paper. So that's again on the, the DC example where like we have like one work unit, which is the ticon off. Here I'm showing the two work unit things. So like we, and I'm learning the, I'm learning the mean. So we, and we see that we have like one conductive body that is clustered, but then we have a resistive body that basically just revert back to a ticon, the ticon off inversion as well. We have the three work unit that I showed before. And then the fourth work unit, it, it depends. Like, so sometime when there are three work units, like, the inversion can turn off one of the clusters. And actually when I run that four cluster inversion first, the fourth cluster was uh, turned off, but I really wanted to here see what will happen if I kept it. So I actually forced it to stay on always. And we see that now we are getting like a halo around it or some like some things at the surface. So now it start, things start to see that. And we see that the two clusters are very close to each other in the GMM too. So it's actually a sign that maybe here we're distinguishing too much. So there is sign to see in the inversion of like, if you have not enough, you're just back to a ticon of inversion. And if you have too much, well, you're gonna start to add a lot of structures very quickly that you're gonna see that in your inversion result. Uh, one that was less, uh, one that was less um, harder to look at was actually uh, book penon, where like I chose three units because in the borehole we were seeing like uh, fresh water transition zone and uh, conductive, but I, I ran it also for like just two units and four units and now it's a choice of the interpreter like the, the two unit one was working fine as well but the unit we're spreading more than an order of magnitude so i wanted to have like a bit more like uh, detail into my classification and when i ran and when i ran the fourth unit i was actually getting further and further like bigger contrast at depth and, and adding more structures that were not required by the data so that's how why i chose this the three units it it was a nice compromise between seeing what's in the borehole and what's and what we see in the geophysical data and so the second part of the question that i can see uh with uh and i don't have a slide for that but that's actually also a very good question so when i talk about the pit of uh, the, the geology information i'm talking about that proportion and that a proportion of a rock unit i'm very aware that it can be a very hard thing to uh to, to, uh, to estimate from the start. And I'm very glad to say that when you set it just, glo just globally, the impact of that parameters is very negligible. And that's, I think that's a great feature because that means that you don't have to be very precise for that. And you really make an impact with that parameters when you set it locally to zero and one. So we're like really when you're sure that a rock unit is not present or is definitely present at a location or or when you're starting to uh, have it learn it localized everywhere with that GMM rep that I show at the end. But if you set it globally, you almost don't have to worry about the values that you put. And actually that's, in practice, that's what I do. I, I put like initial guess in the GMM on it, but I don't care too much about it. And I pretty much never revisit those values after. So I think, I think, actually, I think that for this specific thing, it's actually good that we, we, we're not very sensitive to it when set globally. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, yeah, I have no more questions in. Perhaps uh, we, we're at an hour and a half, so perhaps we should close this, Thibault. And, and thank you again very much. That was absolutely fabulous. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of viewing of the recording on, on the YouTube and on MTNet channel. So thanks again, Thibault. And um, just a reminder to everybody, we're back on the air next week, an hour earlier, uh, with, a, with a, another MNR. Uh, goodbye, thanks again, Thibault, and goodbye to everybody. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, uh, Max, and thanks, Stephen, for organizing again. That's, uh, uh, it's, been, it's been great. Like, I really, I really, like, uh, like, uh, I really appreciate being invited. So. All the best. Yeah, thank you.